somebody's going to choose the other guess. Um, so Chris McCoy, he is a uh, founder, co-founder of u 3 It, which is a company where people with uh, as little as an idea or concept to go and then get their idea 3D printed uh, from start to finish. And uh, he teaches a hands-on rapid prototyping course, which I personally took a year ago now uh, at, at Haas, or yeah, for the Center of uh, Technology Entrepreneurship. And uh, let's give him a hand, and he's about to introduce Chris. And I don't know if any of you had a chance to look them up or if you had access, but I'd also like, before we get started, just to recognize some of the other guests coming from Belgium. We have Tim and Arnie uh, as part of their team, and they may jump in from time to time. And then lastly, before I introduce these two, uh, we might take a selfie at the end. So if you don't want to be in a photo with us at the end, if that's okay, just get off to the side. Otherwise, jump in the photo. We Marketing material. Exactly, important. right? <laughs> So, um, so anyhow, uh, just to sort of introduce a couple really talented people, uh, Philip Desmet, he's a good friend of mine, met him back in Madrid, um, and LinkedIn describes him as a target-driven software engineer, demonstrated ability to adapt uh, new technology and concepts, motivated to deliver exceptional engineering to result in their creation, growth, and maintenance of successful products. Uh, his specialties are web development, taking idea to concept and implementation. Uh, he has past entrepreneurial experience from the likes of Lead by Strings, Mingler, and Mashpan. Has his dual master's degrees in computer science from University of Autónoma de Madrid, and then also the Antwerpen, University of Antwerpen, with great distinction in both counts. So, welcome, <laughs> Philip Desmet. And then his colleague, Mr. Jorn Van uh, from also from uh, Belgium, and he's the VP of Marketing at Intuo, and his LinkedIn describes him as a strong believer in vision, as a base for innovation and future exploration. Uh, his entrepreneurial spirit drives my, his passion in creating the concepts and brands that are aligned with his shared vision every step of the way. He's a co-founder and creative director at Rendezvous. As described in LinkedIn as you, me, drinks, now. Uh, so you can ask him about those uh, entrepreneurial efforts as well. Um, he's on the board director of a company called BusyD, uh, and then uh, has a dual masters as well in international <laughs> business from Aston University in Birmingham, UK. Uh, he also has a product development masters from the Hoge School of Antwerpen in Belgium, and then lastly a BS in Industrial design from Nicolas Superior de in Design in Lisbon, Portugal. So, welcome to you as well. You. Round of applause. We are already at 615, which is incredible. Uh, we are going to try to keep at least 20 minutes to 15 minutes worth of time for question and answer. So, if I don't get to something that you want to hear them talk about, um, feel free to, to save those questions. Uh, but first, let's get started. Um, so, Philip and Jorn, you both started the sort of the wonderful journey of entrepreneurship. Tell us why you got involved and uh, how that all start. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always wanted to basically be my own boss. Um, it goes back to when I was pretty young. My father always has been an entrepreneur, um, actually shipping containers and repairing containers in the harbor of Antwerp in Belgium, which is like the third biggest harbor in the world. And I used to do student jobs in summer with him. I think just family based, like small family owned business, it sparked like you know the lemonade stands in, um, in the US that you hear so much about, I think that something like that sparked my interest in uh, entrepreneurship so much and also I was always thinking okay either I start my own business or I commute and go work at a bank every day, I wake up at 6 and now I can wake up at 8 or 9 a.m. which is a huge difference and I can just work into the night which is amazing for me. Um, but also, obviously, because uh, all the people you work with in startups, they're, they're so passionate. Um, Francis, my uh, co-founder in there, who's also our CEO, super passionate and driven guy. Um, same with our CEO, same with VP of Marketing. These are young people that just want to change something to, to a process or whatever that is broken, and that always sparked something in me. So, yeah, some sense of entitlement, I think, just like, I was born to do this, and I'm going to do it. So I'm going to be your own boss. How about you? Um, so for me, I kind of rolled into it. So as I finished my master's degree in international business, uh, so it was a very internationally diverse audience. So I met with a Greek guy 
uh, we became a good friend and sparring partner for the academic assignments we got. Um, and at one point he broke his leg, uh, and he's kind of a flirtatious guy, so he, he, was, he was forced into bed for three months, so he started using these dating apps, but this is back in 2011, right? And he got really frustrated by, by how uh, these services were providing their services because like, he wanted to meet people, he wanted to talk to real people, but at the end of the day, these apps didn't want you to meet someone, right? Uh, the more you spend on these apps, the more money they made. So he came up with a very simple idea, like, let's make a, a service that is just you know, focused on getting two people together ASAP and monetize it that way. So as a side project, you know, the You Me Drinks Now project, basically, um, was a startup that we launched in London in 2012, I believe, um, where we um, put two people together based on the activity they wanted to perform, right? You wanted to go for a coffee, a, a glass of wine, or a fancy cocktail. We partnered up with the fanciest bars in London, and uh, we took 50% commission of those drinks. So we started very, like, very bootstrapped, we did some crowdfunding campaigns which turned out to be successful. We had some angels on board, but we did a lot of small rounds, which like looking back I wouldn't do again. Uh, and then we had to go for the big, uh, bigger round with the VCs. Uh, and as a, you know, a, B2B, a B2C startup, um, very you know, dating kind of like atmosphere, it's very difficult to get funding, your metrics need to be like through the roof. Um, so we had to kind of, because of cash flow reasons, we had to fire our employees and stop the business. And during that period, you go through a lot of um, you know, thoughts and you need to make a lot of decisions. And during that time, I knew Tim, the CEO, uh, before that uh, very well. And we talked, I think, on a weekly basis just to spar a bit. Like, you, you often don't know how to, uh, you know, what kind of choices you need to make. So. After that, we dissolved the company, and he was like, "Dude, we need someone to do our marketing. We're, you know, growing quite fast as Intuo. Uh, would you be willing to do that?" And I, um, my main objection was like, well, "I don't want to be an employee. Like, I would, I w if the moment you started to make me feel like I'm an employee, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I would want to get out." So that was my main uh, objection. And I mean, I'm super happy to have joined the team a year and a half ago. And the business has grown significantly, 259% to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the increase in revenue in 2017. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. yeah, I think one major milestone that we hit was one point something million uh, dollars in recurring revenue, which we recently hit, so we're quite proud of that. That's where yeah, the growth is coming. That is definitely a tough metric to, uh, to hit. Um, so just on that note, we all will be talking a lot about, we heard from Augustine that um, a lot of your panelists and I guess guest speakers maybe haven't touched enough on venture capital funds and how to raise them, when to raise them, so we'll talk about that. We'll also be talking about how to build a team, and these folks have built a, a rock star team, so we'll talk about that as well. And, Sort of my role on the panel is to talk to you a little bit about helping bring an idea into a real physical part. But why don't we tell the folks who maybe don't know, uh, what is Intuo? It, it, you know, on your website it says a platform to coach better, but tell us what problem you're solving and why you decided to solve that problem. Sure, I think the major thing we're trying to solve is um, employee turnover. Um, so basically, with our software, we're trying to create better cultures and companies, right? So imagine, um, you're working at a big company and your manager talks to you once every two, three months, which kind of sucks because you don't you're reporting to them. But you know they're not doing real, really good coaching. And our tool is, is some software that facilitates that coaching and it helps you, you know, give feedback to your coworkers, talk to your manager more. Um, it allows you to log all those things and just it helps you in. In creating this profile and this log of okay, what have I done this year, and, and what can I do better? You can lock your skills. Um, it just keeps track of what you're doing as an employee, and, and it, it tries to you know help with the culture in the company. And as a result, um, I think Tim is great at pitching this, by the way. But as a result, we help um, yeah decrease the employee turnover, which is uh, a huge cost saving in a lot of companies. Because if you know that you 
imagine 50% of your workforce leaves every year, that's a huge cost for you. And if you could let employees on average stay maybe two to three days even, or maybe a week longer or two weeks longer, that's a huge cost you're saving in terms of recruitment, in terms of onboarding, just in terms of culture as well. I mean, your, your current people don't want to you know, get new colleagues all the time. So that's where we come in, and uh, our software really helps with that. You know, that's uh, very clear. But. And then just to give you some perspective, I think it's about 20% of a salary is basically what goes into the cost of life. You know, something like that. Yeah. For executive level, it's up to 40%. So that's yeah. a big cost saving. Yeah. Um, and so you're a co-founder, and you're the VP. What about, I guess, how long was it before you know you joined the team? And because you were, I guess, there close to the beginning. Uh, the beginning. Pretty close. I mean, I think Tim and Jill, the other co-founder, they were working on it for about a year, I think. Um, but they were kind of struggling finding someone technical to build it out, and that really sparked my interest in them as a person. I don't really care about so much about the idea or, or what we work on. Heck, we might as well work on an adult website for all that matters. I don't really mind as long as the people are really passionate about a problem that we're trying to solve. And, and when I first met them and Jill, they were super passionate. They were just talking to customers or potential customers all the time. And I just felt like, okay, either I, I, I drop everything and I join them or I go get a job. And, and they were super open to me in terms of negotiating equity and, and, and whatnot. So we just said, okay, we don't take a salary for a year year and a half and just you know give it all and I just lived out of my parents basement basically just coding day and night and uh, yeah I mean so far it's worked out pretty well uh, very cool and, and when you came on your role was precisely to do marketing right to help yeah. grow so well I mean we're in a very immature market right like uh, if you look at it from an Im uh, a marketing perspective a lot of companies realize that their people are leaving, like 30% of your workforce is leaving every year, but they don't necessarily know uh, how to solve it or what their problem is, right? So, um, and uh, I mean, a solution to uh, increasing your uh, your employees to stay is it could be performance management done better, but like not a lot of people would search those terms. Uh, so at the time I joined, uh, Google AdWords was the main thing they were using. Um, and the demo request button on the website. So since then, it's been uh, my my duty uh, to uh, to basically have an inbound system in place, which we're still, you know, working on as we speak. Uh, and it's it's been a fun ride because I come from a B two C environment, and a B two B is a lot more, yeah, you know, it's a lot more analytical. It's a lot more structured, like you can predict the things a lot better as well. So I put in, you know, a hundred euros or dollars, uh, and I will get X amount of leads. With a, in a B2C environment, it's a lot more to do with luck, I think, and, uh, and uh, creating certain features that, you know, uh, create a word of mouth with a lot of users. Um, so, but I also think that coming from a B2C environment, it allows you to be a lot more creative in solving certain problems or uh, grasping people's attentions in, in a more boring B2B environment as well. Um, everybody know, raise your hand if uh, you study B2B companies, right, business models, right? B2C, more, more so, right? Okay, just kind of curious. Um, cool, and you said people add, could you say what that is? Yeah, so B2B, uh, who, can, who can volunteer what B2B means? Uh, B2B means business to business. Correct. So your products are other businesses. Yeah, and what might be an advantage to a B2B? Um, sort of business. Uh, you don't have to spend as much on marketing. You sell more on salespeople, good salespeople. Yeah, the sale, the what's called the sales cycle tends to be a bit longer, but the you know the revenue per customer is a bit higher. Yeah, it's quite interesting. It's actually a coincidence where you're in town because um, we're working out of Belgium, but we're here for this uh, SaaS conference, this big software conference called SaaSer, and uh, today we attended a talk, B2B versus B2C, uh -huh. and um, it was by this guy Justin Kahn, who sold a startup for a billion to Amazon back in 2014, which is a B2C company, Twitch, by the way, is um, live video gaming, streaming, stuff like that. And um, he was always saying, you know, in B2C you just ride a big wave. You kind of have to be lucky to make it. Uh, but versus B2B where you just, you know, solve a really tangible problem where you just go in and say, okay, this is my customer, this is the persona or the buyer profile, I'm going to solve this for them and they're going to buy it, they're going to give me money. In B2C, 
you're kind of just like, I don't know, like touching the dark or how, however you want to say it. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's very hard to know whether you're on the right track in B2C. Yeah. Um, so, so a little bit, uh, so B2C, business to consumer, right? Yeah, uh, that's all of us, right? <laughs> Um, so I have a company, it's a marketplace for 3D design and rapid prototyping. So Augustine mentioned that I can tell you that we've shifted towards B2B sales, predominantly for that reason, like more predictable sales cycle, more tangible value proposition, and the customer segmentation is a bit easier that way. Uh, we still have a sort of a consumer look and feel, which has presented challenges to us, but anyhow. Uh, okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about this idea to MVP. Um, first off, what is an MVP and what was your first MVP? And why did it, like, what were you, what were you hoping to achieve with that? I don't know. I mean, I can talk about the MVP of Rendezvous, and then you can talk about the MVP of Venture, sure. right? Okay. Uh, so, I mean, me and George, non-technical founders, a big challenge as uh, Tim and Jill also experienced is finding that one person that is devoted to creating, you know, that product, make it, co make it come to life. Um, so, we tried a lot of ways of making that work. I mean, we had this guy who came in from Madrid, actually, and we were like, look, dude, like, you're good. He just won a hackathon. We, we kind of seduced him into making our first version, uh, and our the pay that we were going to give him is our couch in London. Like, you can live with us, no, no costs, and we'll give you 500 pounds, which is nothing in London. Uh, a month and you build the product but that didn't work out very well because he wasn't experienced enough in building a whole product uh, so we were back to square one then we found this development agency uh, in Barcelona actually um, but they it would cost us 20,000 euros to build our first MVP so uh, an MVP is basically a product as a founder you have this idea of oh yes, my app will do this, and then people can do that, and blah, blah, blah. You have all these ideas, but an MVP is forcing yourself of thinking, what is essential? What do I want people to get from my app? Like, if they would have to tell someone, what would they say it does, right? Uh, so it's like a branch, and you, you, you chop everything off, and what remains is your MVP. So um, we actually took a um, personal loan to build our first MVP because we went to a tons of investors and I, I, I assume that maybe in the US it's a bit more easy, maybe not not anymore, to find like that, you know, seed capital, but in, in Belgium it's it's quite tough. Um, so but still I'm very proud that we did that because that kinda gave us a lot of momentum and uh, you know allowed us to be in tech crunch. Credibility, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you got credibility from that, but then you have a lot of people downloading the app, and it turns out to be absolute crap, <laughs> uh, which is okay as an MVP, right? Because you learn a lot from uh, your users using that exact product. I don't really have anything to add to it, but uh, just basically an MVP is minimum viable product, and the idea is just that you take the smallest problem in your vision that you want to solve, and you focus on that, and it can be missing features. Uh, it doesn't have to be feature complete, in other words. Just has to be good. By the way, going up, can I? Yeah, sure, sure. Right away. Um, yeah. About going on about the MVP thing. Um, what a lot of founders, um, I think, do wrong, and I talked to you about that as well. Yeah. Is uh, this, the famous thing called going by Paul Graham? I don't know if anyone knows. Paul Graham, Graham. you know Paul Graham. Okay, cool. So he you, defined you this thing him. as uh, the trap of sorrow. Yeah. So um, you've got a graph. Um, on the x-axis, it's time, and on the y-axis, um, you've got basically interest in your product. And Jorn, he talked about TechCrunch, right? So you built your MVP, and you're here in the beginning of time, and then all of a sudden you're super happy, and you're launching on TechCrunch, and you go like, woo! And you're on a high, right? Here is your TechCrunch launch. But then, like, after a few days, everything slows down and you're starting to lose interest and traffic and no one is downloading your app anymore and you're like, Jesus, what the hell is happening? I thought we were on TechCrunch and we were doing so well. Turns out no one cares about your startup and then basically you're here. And this is called, um, this whole area I would like to call is the trough of sorrow where you just struggle, 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 struggle and these, this is interest, no one really cares as you see. But then at some point you get some wiggles of false hope, they call it, and then it goes back down. <laughs> and then eventually, if you can get through it, you get in this magical thing where you just kind of blow up. And there you kind of 
There you get like market scale. product market fit. Right? Exactly. Yeah. There you have product market fit, which means that the market appreciates your product and wants to pay for it or use it. And here you go into a scaling phase. But probably about 90% of the people never get here that start a startup, so you're pretty much stuck in this thing. And that's what makes it so hard. And, and people really, they get depressed over this. They, it's, it's a really big thing, or becoming a really big, big thing. The, the, the thing is, though, like every time like, if you have your startup, you, you, you start, okay, you build a new feature, right? You think, oh, that's going to be the one. And you always think you're here. And that's what keeps you going, right? But if, actually, you're, you're right here. Like in reality, that's the whole point, right? Exactly. Yeah. It's a it's a tough time. If you folks want to ask me about what that feels like, I'm happy to explain. Um, but uh, before we move on to the piece of funny stuff, there. yeah, we've all been there, right? Um, what what are the top three do's and don'ts uh, for getting a company off the ground? Try to keep it under a minute. Uh, that's pretty easy to do. Okay. Um, talk to your users. Um, build things. Um, the third one, just focus on the problem at hand and then follow your vision. Don't try to solve everything, just try to solve one specific problem for a small set of users. They want to make super happy, not just anyone, um, which is the hardest thing, I think, strategically, also to drive a team. Uh, so these are my top three do's. The don'ts are really, uh, a lot of people go networking at events, so you go to meetup.com and you see entrepreneurial drinks and you're like I'm gonna meet my co-founder there or I'm gonna find an investor don't do that it's all bullshit just focus on your users focus on the problem and just build and I think that's the most important thing. Have anything to add? Um, yeah I, I think I agree with him like solve a, a big problem for a small group of people is a lot more interesting and that comes down to my second point like if, uh, so if you want to have product market fit we were discussing it, it's uh, having a customer message fit, basically, and you make it a lot easier on yourself, focusing on a small group of people, uh, tailoring your message to their pains, so that they will understand it, they will adopt your product or buy your service or whatever that might be, uh, and scale on that group of people, and then you can still diversify to other segments or you know, problems that people might have. Uh, Jordan mentioned product market fit, have you guys heard that term now? Uh, I mean, I know that one of the founders of Airbnb described it as almost like two gears, like you have your transmission and like your gearbox, and it's like they're both spinning, but, but nothing's connecting, right? And it's, it's when you do one thing that really hits that, that sort of shark bite yeah. problem, they just kind of, they, once they connect, that's where you get that nice growth curve. Just the an end. FYI, the Airbnb founders, they apparently spend about a thousand days in the trough of sorrows, according to them. So that's three years, three years of just sleeping on the floor of their apartment, renting it out. Um, so yeah, it's pretty tough startups. I mean, and also the, like, to describe product market fit, we just saw a talk earlier at Shaster. Uh, so the guy, the founder of segment.io, he described it that, okay, if you don't have product market fit, so you're trying, as a founder or as a company, you're trying, constantly trying to push your product or service to people. And the moment you realize you have product market fit is like, he describes it that you really feel it, like the market is really pushing for the solution, like you're really solving a problem for them. And uh, I think like they tried three different products before they actually had that product market fit. So it is a struggle. I think it is a search he described it as that 80% of founders will never experience product market fit. So I think this is a good segue. So you obviously Within two, uh, you guys figured out that you you were onto something, right? And at some point, you realized that you could be sleeping on a couch for 500 euros a night or whatever it was. So, VC funding. I believe you guys raised some money for this company. Would you mind telling the audience a little bit about you know when did you know that you had something that investors would buy into, and what was that process like? Sure. Um, do you want to go? Or should I? But yeah, I mean, you can talk about so, it too. Yeah, sure. So we raised about a million euros, which is about 1.3 million dollars in seats uh, about two years ago. Um, and I mean, it, it's very hard to know for an investor whether you're onto something at that point. Um, more than anything, an investor should believe in the team, and that's also what in a team or a theme in a team, team like sorry. the people. Yeah, got it. Yeah. A theme, not yeah. so maybe. It depends if, if, if it's really experienced in the vertical, he could. No, but I would go for the team, here. for the people. Yeah, um, people. I don't think I'm that 
such a thick accent. <laughs> 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 I mean, I just wanted to clarify. No, just kidding. But yeah, um, we raised about 200k uh, from angels and about 800k from bank loans, actually. Uh, yeah, um, and it's pretty much trying to convince that first investor. Um, and once you've got that lead kind of on board, then it all trickles down. But gosh, it's 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 really tough, man. Like. There's not a proven way how to raise money. It's I think it's a matter of um, confidence of you know having something that a person believes in and that person has a lot of money. And in the Bay Area, especially like San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and stuff, you got all those famous VC firms, right? And they all, every entrepreneur from from the whole world really comes here and tries to raise some money. And I think that's kind of stupid, to be honest, um, because. Uh, let me elaborate. These people, they're more focused on raising the money than on actually trying to grow their business. Um, and we spent about nine months raising that money, which is a very long time, and it almost killed our company. It, it turned out well, but if I had to do it again, I would probably try to do it again, just because we needed the money, else we wouldn't exist today either. But it's such a major distraction, really. At some point, we had about we had about, I don't know how many employees that we have when we raised the money, eight, nine? Eight, yeah. yeah. Like we had about 20, 30K in the bank, so not enough to pay them anymore. So, and the payroll was due in one week, two weeks, and then all of a sudden it just hit, and the puzzle, like the last piece of the puzzle just fit. But I don't really, honestly, I don't have so much um, do's and don'ts for fundraising. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but. Yeah, there, we did a lot of don'ts, so uh, <laughs> it's, it's just what I was thinking, like the, the, the thing you mentioned before, like the, that tough part, even if listening to all, all the things that people say, entrepreneurs, you got to make mistakes and you have to be in there, otherwise you never get out of it. So it's not like we can speed things up. Mm -hmm. And for fundraising, um, it's really passion. Well, I think we did it with passion. It's seat, it's passion, and yeah. Series A, Series yeah, yeah. B, which are the stages metrics. after its metrics. Yeah. Yeah. And then it depends if you're SaaS. Uh, I don't know how technical it is. Go with. Yeah. But, but I mean, the, the don'ts are just really ch don't chase. People try to get a no really quick. Um, because what happens a lot is that you're stuck between a yes and a no. You know, uh, an investor, they have this thing called FOMO, fear of missing out. And they're just going to be like, I don't really want to invest, but I don't want to say no either because... That's going to keep you updated. Yeah, if, if this ever blows up like an Uber in the last five years or something, I mean, you don't want to go to your limited partners, basically the people you report to saying, yeah, I missed out on Uber. Um, so they don't want to say no immediately, but that should be your goal as an entrepreneur, get a no as quickly as possible. Because yeah. um, maybe it never helps you, you're just stuck. Yeah, uh, and in our case, we uh, we did um, equity-based crowdfunding. You know that, like you you basically as as a as a you know regular Joe, you can invest up from ten dollars into a company, and you get zero point zero zero one percent of the company, or whatever that might be. Right. So that was the first thing we did because we didn't find investors at that time. Um, and we, the first one we did, we failed, but we learned immediately from our mistakes because we were approaching it as those people were proper investors and we were trying to speak their language while everybody's you know, prone to marketing, right? So the second uh, campaign we launched, we were successful and we overfunded the campaign. So that allowed us to, um, I think, do our first marketing campaigns and stuff like that. And also, because we had that momentum, we had other angels reaching out to us and wanting to invest as well. So it's, again, all about FOMO. If people start to get, start getting this feeling like, oh, this is hot right now, and uh, I think also for a lot of investors nowadays, because of the tax incentive scheme you get in Europe, uh, it's, we were just talking about it, like, it, it's for investors or bankers, it's the new, you know, uh, red Ferrari or whatever. It's like, yeah, I invested in a startup, but it's pretty cool. Uh, so um, I think that's also a thing. And um, I mean, we, I think it's a lot of hustle as well. I, I remember at one point we went to Canary Wharf, which is the financial district in London, and we handed out envelopes 
you know, uh, with a letter in it saying that we were crowdfunding, and on the envelope you wrote, like in a really big letters, your next bonus. So we just handed that out in the financial district, really hustling uh, our way up to getting our campaigns fully funded. And one mistake I would say you shouldn't make, and we did make, is often because you need to pay the people that you need to pay, is that we raised very small rounds sometimes, you know, giving us a runway of six months. Uh, so we would have six months of survival with the money that we raised. And I think, looking back, it's something that I wouldn't have done. I think as a company you need at least 12 to 18 months of runway with the money that you raise. Otherwise, what you're doing is what you said earlier on, is you're not running a business, you're raising but money you can't pay. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the big difference. There's two last things that I want to say about the public move. Well, maybe you want to ask me more, but there's this thing you, I think you should look at it um, from a mathematical or algorithmic point of view as well. You know, bread first versus debt first. So bread is like this, debt is like this, horizontal versus vertical. And what you should do is um, basically it, point, it boils down to having a, an option B, C, and D. So bread first means you should talk to all your investors in parallel, while debt first is where you go down a route um, with one investor and just go deep, 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 deep. But he's not going to give you a no, so you're just going down into like a hole, a black hole, which is not going to lead anywhere versus if you're going bread first, um, wide basically, then you know, you can always play them up against each other and, and kind of get some deal out of the first one really quick. Then go to the other and say, hey, there's this uh, angel that wants to invest 200 k Maybe we can do a co-investment or do you want to counter the offer or whatever. So going wide is always the better option there. And the second thing is um, maybe you shouldn't do... Um, VC funding or angel or whatever funding. Um, so back to the Airbnb story, maybe maybe some of you know it, but um, back in 2008, so 10 years ago they were getting started, and uh, they were struggling with money, and it was the Obama versus McCain um, elections, and so they flew, I think it was in New York, some kind of thing, I don't know how it goes, the elections in, in the U.S., it's, it's crazy thing. They screwed up so far. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Trump and politics here, just Obama and McCain, uh, but basically they were all designer dudes, and um, so they designed um, this kind of cornflakes boxes with Obama's head on it and uh, McCain's head on it, and they sold them, so they just were selling cornflakes on the street, but they were just artsy cornflakes boxes, and they raised about 50k that day, just in one day, which bought them another six months of runway, probably, just to iterate on their Airbnb idea, which is now a multi-billion dollar company. So I think it's very important to be resourceful, uh, to be relentless, and to just not give up on your faith, and if you believe in it, there will be tough times, but, you know, the cockroaches survive, and they're the only ones that are going to build. Unicorns, as they call them. So, yeah, yeah, the cockroach to unicorn, right? Yeah. Um, the, so I never dabbled in the fundraising thing with the exception of a Skydeck demo day. Uh, how many of you have heard of Skydeck? Cool. Um, apply. It's a cool uh, incubator program here for Cal students who are very resourceful. I always think of Cal students as some of the most resourceful right here at the number one. I think university. American students are very resourceful and very, they have a huge sense of entitlement as well. <laughs> and which I mean in a positive way, by the way. They're like, I, I deserve too. this, like, I'm going to do it. It's, it's, good. it's pretty unique in the U.S. I can tell you that, yeah, going into those without confidence is definitely not a good idea. The other things I've heard, even though I haven't, again, I always thought it was a distraction, so I focus on customers first. But uh, if you're going to go into raising money, you got to go in full, like no, no dipping your toe into it. And then uh, with respect to um, just books to read, there's Brad Feld's Venture Deals. He talks about it from the legal standpoint, the entrepreneur standpoint, and the VC standpoint. So you can understand this limited partner relationship and how that all works. But I want to move quickly into to how to build a team, because that's obviously an important part of building a successful company. Um, so, you know. How do you folks think about uh, bringing on new employees, uh, and what do you sort of what are you what are you sort of looking for if you have an RV? Sure. Set it. Um, yeah. For me, the number one trait, obviously, apart from their skill set, their hard skill. So I'm CTO, so I mostly hire developers. So we're a team about six or seven people report to me today. Um, 
We're 25 in total, by the way, so pretty small company. Um, but what I think is very important is uh, communication. There's nothing as important, in fact, as communication. I think all the things that are going wrong today in our company, due to scaling and due to growth problems, are at the root of the problem is always communication. And if a person cannot communicate fluently in English, which is not a problem for all of you guys, but in Europe we have like 20 different languages and we all communicate in English, it, it, it's pretty important for me. Um, so that's a major thing I look at. Also, our whole team is remote, so uh, which is a big deal for me. I spend time in Barcelona, Madrid, the Bay Area, um, Brussels. If you, if you want to be there, uh, Ghent, obviously, where our headquarters is. So I spend time everywhere, and I hire remotely everywhere, So, I, which, which gives us an advantage, I think. But yeah, communication is, is pretty important for me in English. So. Anything to add to that? Um, I mean, not a lot. I think uh, hire for culture, like having a, a good fit in the company, is very important. I think when it comes to technical profiles, it's a bit more different, right? Um, but um, I think in the past we've hired people where we thought like, okay, they're super skilled and they're, you know, they're gonna nail it. But eventually if, if the culture doesn't fit very well, it, it will turn out nasty for both sides in some way. Not nasty, it's a bad choice of words, but like, uh, not, not, you know, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna end well. You're not gonna stay together as a, as a matter of fact. And I also have one lesson learned is that um, as you're bootstrapped, I would always argue to give the people you know that want to work for you. It's a, it's a blessing we had at Rendezvous that a lot of people wanted to work for our company, but you know you're you don't have any money, and eventually if they don't earn anything, then or it's not something they have to do for school, uh, they're just going to leave you because there's another opportunity on the way. So I would al always argue to say no to those kind of opportunities because you're going to put a lot of energy in it, and it's not going to. You know, you're not going to be able to you know, reap the benefits of your energy that you put into it. So pay them at least something so that they're accountable in yeah. some way. Um, so that would be mine. So I can attest to that. Uh, we have a team of about four people that all had to sort of divulge uh, from our company because of just lack of, uh, of funds, right? To pay people, right? And you can't hire the best talent, right? You all, you all want to have great jobs out of here, getting paid well. Um, and so we are constantly competing with other opportunities that are out there. And so raising money, even though it's a big pain, uh, it does give you some leverage and build some credibility and things like that. Um, so it's about 10 minutes. One thing I do oh, want to yeah. add, and Tim also yeah. wants to Great. say something, but one last thing is I think you should hire for strengths and not lack of weaknesses. Got so it. if you look at a person and you say, he's okay at that, he's okay at that, he's okay at that, but he doesn't excel or she doesn't excel at anything, you're probably not going to have to hire him or her, I think. Um, you really need the strength to be... Superstar in, in one dimension or exactly. a, couple, a few dimensions, but over breadth in this case. Yeah, I think one thing I wanted to add in terms of recruiting people is, uh, if you look at the, the company that we, we have built, is we are such diverse, well, folks of personality, like... Ari is completely different than I am, I'm completely different than Philip is and then Jorn is. And that's still we manage to work together in a culture that is really thriving. And it's having these different perspectives that have has brought us to the fact that we have probably gone slowly through that tough period. Because bringing knowledge together and different perspectives is way much stronger than just everybody walking in the same direction and saying, yeah, 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 it's great, great, great. Yeah. Everybody wants to hear you're doing great. Yeah. You need people who are pessimistic I yeah. think, in your company. Yeah. But you also need, your CEO should be an optimist. And I think the people around, like the COO who's sitting in, I think personally should be more pessimistic, say, dragging him a little bit down even, I think, sometimes. Because yeah. else Real he's estate. just going to fly, fly, fly and, and dream big things. And obviously the money in your bank is endless as well. And, you gotta be realistic. I think maybe pessimist was the wrong word. Maybe realist. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just uh, add two things about hiring? Because I've recruited a few people as well uh, in my time. <laughs> <laughs> All those years. No, so, so there's two big learnings. So first of all, what like young companies and startups, what they tend to do is they tend to hire because everybody gives them the same advice, right? Hire for strengths 
and make sure that there's a culture fit so people forget that what the actual point is, is to hire someone for specific responsibilities. So what we did, and we did that quite a lot, actually, to be honest, we didn't learn our lesson after, after the first time, is just to hire the person that sits in front of me. We just like the guy, we see the strengths, but we don't really have a job in mind that they can do, so we just hire them, and we think, yeah, it's, it's all going to work out. We'll just, we'll just see what, what they will do on Monday. You know, they'll, they'll turn up and something magical is going to happen. So that doesn't happen. Just to be very clear, you need to have a, a, a really good role, and then you can think about what kind of person do we need for that role, and then you think about all the other stuff like culture fit and diversity, etc. And then secondly, there's a lot of things that you can learn from books and talks, but um, recruiting and uh, thinking, estimating how a person is going to be in the long run, that's something you cannot learn from books. It's just impossible. I've never seen anyone succeed at that first like 10 or 20 times. So I would say the most important advice uh, I could give to people building a team in the beginning is look for some seniority to help you. Look for a coach, look for maybe uh, another startup that's, that, that, that's nearby. Have them sit next to you and say, look, I want to hire this salesperson. Um, do you want to sit next to me in the interview, ask some questions, etc.? Because it takes experience and that's it. I just want to add one more thing to that, which I, I completely agree with Arnie. And um, you, if any of you, when you graduate, are thinking of applying to a startup and there are like five people, ten people, it's going to be an amazing journey, but look out for red flags. Um, like he said, is there a clear responsibility for me when I start on Monday? Do I know what to do? Will I be onboarded in a good way? But also you can be, I wouldn't say be arrogant in your negotiation, but negotiate. So if I would join a startup today, I would ask them how much runway do you have? How much money do you have in the bank? You'd be surprised and amazed how many startups are just hiring and next month they can't afford your salary anymore. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to, you know, start at a company and the next month go look for another job. It's, it's, it's just shitty, but a lot of people do that, believe me. So I would just um, be vocal and, and just be confident. And if, if they want you and you get into a negotiation phase, it means you can negotiate. It's called negotiation for something. It goes both ways. So negotiate your salary, ne negotiate your benefits ask questions, ask any metrics you're interested in, and if the founders who are interviewing you can't answer those metrics, it's a huge red flag and you should look for another um, job or startup, I think. I think that's all sound advice, and I'm happy to talk more after this, because I'm here in town, um, but I want to open it up to questions or comments or you don't want to call us out on our bullshit, whatever you want to... <laughs> don't ask me any metrics. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. Who do you guys study in college? Me? Computer science. Computer science. Yeah, do yeah. you think, I mean, obviously it helps you in your job. Uh, do you, like, take day-to-day -day stuff? Does it help you every day? Definitely. I mean, I learned so much in terms of math, logic, um, I think perseverance. So I came from a, a very bad background in terms of math, and I was struggling so much through university. And I wasn't so fortunate to go to something like UC Berkeley, but like a shitty city college. In my um, sorry, I was city college guy too. <laughs> sorry, but um, yeah, it, it definitely helps me. Um, but I think there, if you want to work at a startup, by the way, I think you should focus on one of a few core um, traits or whatever you should. You should own, which is either you should be good at product or engineering or sales or marketing, probably one of those four, and you will get a job. Um, and if, but if you study something like philosophy and you're a smart guy, yeah. it doesn't matter, man. Like, yeah. be smart, be resourceful, get things done. And I don't really believe in, in particular degrees, to be honest, especially for sales, marketing, and that stuff. Uh, I have a bachelor's, master's, and PhD from uh, our alma mater, Go Bears, right? Um, but, uh, but just to add to what, what Philip said, um, <clears throat> gosh, well now it skipped me. But anyway, we'll take another question. <laughs> it was, how was it? Anyway, it was a really good point. Anyway, next question. It'll come to me, watch. This is what old age uh, happens to you. Yeah. Okay. Questions for Jorn. <clears throat> how do you think you, did you build your expertise in marketing and, and marketing in college? 
or after the fact? How do you how do you recommend someone who didn't study marketing uh, uh, specifically in university to become an expert in marketing? I think that's a, a very good question. Um, I think my degree in uh, product development, what I liked about, like what I still you know take away with me every day, is the methodology that I, you know they taught us of how to create something new, right? Whether that's a product or a service, to so always like. You know, analyze everything, benchmark everything quite well before you move on. Um, but I, I don't, like I don't feel like a marketeer per se, and I think ev anyone can do marketing. If you're a philosopher, I think you can do marketing. I think it's just about you know, it's it's it has a lot more to do with entrepreneurship than anything else. It's about questioning you know, what is the product? How do we you know describe this product to the people that we think you know might buy it? How do we reach those people in the best way possible, uh, and so forth? So I think it has a lot more. To, I think a lot of marketeers would be great entrepreneurs, uh, and vice versa. To be honest, yeah. I remember my point. So um, <laughs> philosophy major, right? So I run a manufacturing company and design company, right? And I went to a panel, and for a PCB manufacturer, printed circuit board manufacturer, it was being run by a philosophy major uh, who had worked at a company called MasterCard, which is a big mechanical engineering supply warehouse. And then the other guy that was on that panel was for an, uh, a CNC manufacturing company, and he had a marketing degree. So it just shows you these are all the CEOs of the company. It doesn't require to have a crazy technical background to run a technical company. In fact, I'm very envious of their ability to do the hustle. I mean, I think in my opinion, like a degree will help you out in the first three to five years of your career. And then afterwards, you'll decide for yourself. You'll find a direction for yourself, right? I mean, it's one thing that you're 18 or 16 and you need to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life, right? So you, you, you choose a direction, but as you grow and mature, you'll find your direction eventually, right? And whether that is entrepreneurship or whether that is, I don't know, writing a book or whatever it might be, I think it's just a part of maturing as a person, as a professional, that you have a degree and that you get a job out of your degree. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so you guys talked about raising money and how you almost ran out of time for like paying employees and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about like maybe on the flip side, do you think it would have been possible for you to have raised too much money, which would have led to like complacence? Or do you think maybe like you could have used another million? Do you think if you got five million, that would have made you less urgent in like your daily pay that's a good question, um, and it's quite funny we're talking about that today. Uh, so earlier last year we were trying to raise a Series A, which is not about our Series C, but it's nonetheless relevant, I think, and our metrics were ju just not good enough, and we, we weren't able to raise money, and so we continued bootstrapping, and, and it is definitely a real threat to your company if you raise too much money, because if you don't have the so-called product market fit, um, then you're just keeping a, yeah, how do you say, you, you just get more and more customers, but if, if they're struggling with the product, you're going to have more support, more uh, onboarding work, just things don't yeah. fit into each other, and then you're going to, you know, if, if a VC then gives you a lot of money, you're going to try to scale something that doesn't work, and then shit will hit the fan, and yeah. it's just not going to work out. Like, for instance, I think, to put it on a more micro level, let's put it on marketing, right? You have a a budget for marketing, your target is to get a hundred leads a month and one lead costs uh, ten, ten dollars, you have a thousand uh, dollars a month but that one month you spend a thousand but you're not getting those hundred leads, right? So what, what decision do you make? Either you request to increase the budget because your you know cost per lead has gone up or you become, you don't, you can't increase the budget so you have to become a lot more resourceful in how you get those leads, right? So I think that's that's the duality there. So either you become sloppy and you don't care how much it costs, but then you're not going to be very effective in reaching your audience, and you might not be reaching the right audience, right? Because it's very expensive to reach the wrong audience. Um, and um, so I think becoming resourceful is very good. Resourceful meaning like as a company, strategically focusing on a certain segment, or as a, on a marketing level, creating cool stuff so that you reach your audience in a much more effective way. But Tim wants to add something. Yeah, well, let's say if we, we would have raised like five million, the thing is that if you raise five million, you have to feel the pull of the market. We feel like it's pulling the market, but it's not like we could inject five million into it. 
-hmm. and the five million on top of my head personally as with investors it would have like pushed me in making decisions that I don't really want to make but I made them because of the fact that they want to make more money yeah. so and that's the balance that's that's the most difficult difficult balancing act for me personally just to make yeah, identify when when is the right moment of course I would like to have the opportunity to invest five million into the company but on the other hand it would, would have ruined the company if we have done that so. So I know some of you folks have to get going. Uh, it's 36, after, uh, a minute after six. So I just want to say thank you to our guest speakers and thank you to all the speakers.